the instability in our spiritual lives that is produced by fear, which is itself produced by a lack of faith. The Israelites actually distrusted God, his plans and his goodness for them. And of course, the judgment that they experienced was not being able to enter the promised land. But like them, how many of us are prone to this, but what if, but what if every possible scenario looming in front of us and eclipsing our vision of the faithfulness of God? I found this little saying, worriers feel every blow that never falls, and they cry over things they will never lose. We exaggerate difficulties, we may even blame and accuse God, and we forget His promises and His faithfulness. This is spiritual instability. Spiritual stability. Unmoving, firm faith. And this was not the experience of the Israelites, as I hope any of us who have been paying attention through this sermon series would have noted by now. In Exodus chapter 24, this is at Mount Sinai, when Moses went and told all the people all the Lord's words and laws, they responded with one voice, everything the Lord has said we will do. Well, that was good. That was positive. That was Exodus 24. Exodus 32. There's a gold calf and all the lewd behavior that accompanies it. They were not a spiritually stable group moving through the desert, and that would not go well in the promised land. But Moses is talking now to, again, a new generation. That previous generation has now all passed away, and they are ready, the new generation to finally enter the land. And in preparing them for this, he references three instances, Moses does, of the Israelites' past during their journeys to the promised land that have caused them to be unstable, inconsistent, things which must not be repeated as they enter into the promised land. And if you or I find that our spiritual lives are prone to a kind of inconsistency. I think in their experiences, we might see some things that help describe our own experiences. So here we go, the first one. The first one Moses references in Deuteronomy chapter 1, starting at verse 24. You're welcome to turn there, of course, in your Bibles. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 24. And in this passage, which I'll read for us in a moment, Moses is recounting to the people their previous, now this would have been their parents' generation, but their previous instance of being on the brink of entering the promised land. They were on the border of Canaan, and we know the story, many of us, they sent spies into the land to kind of reconnoiter about the best way for them to enter. By the way, the spies were not sent in to decide whether or not they should enter, but rather how to go about it. In any event, they send off these spies, and reading here again, starting at verse 24, we read this. The spies left and went up into the hill country and came to the valley of Eshkol and explored it. Taking with them some of the fruit of the land, they brought it down to us and reported, it is a good land that the Lord our God is giving us. Moses goes on, but you were unwilling to go up. You rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. You grumbled in your tents and said, the Lord hates us. So he has brought us up out of Egypt to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. Where can we go? Our brothers have made our hearts melt in fear. They say the people are stronger and taller than we are. The cities are large with walls up to the sky. We even saw the Anakites there. Then I, this is Moses, said to you, do not be terrified. Do not be afraid of them. The Lord your God who is going before you will fight for you. 
as he did for you in Egypt before your very eyes and in the wilderness. There you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a father carries his son all the way you went until you reached this place. In spite of this, you did not trust in the Lord your God who went ahead of you on your journey in fire by night and in a cloud by day to search out places for you to camp and to show you the way you should go. First kind of spiritual instability is the instability caused by fear. Moses says to the people, in spite of this, meaning in spite of all the evidences God has given of his faithfulness and of his presence with you, in spite of this, you did not trust the Lord your God. I wonder if any of us, actually, I wonder if any of us can't identify with this. The instability in our spiritual lives that is produced by fear, which is itself produced by a lack of faith. The Israelites actually distrusted God, his plans and his goodness for them. And of course, the judgment that they experienced was not being able to enter the promised land. But like them, how many of us are prone to this, but what if, but what if, but what if, but what if every possible scenario looming in front of us and eclipsing our vision of the faithfulness of God? I found this little saying, worriers feel every blow that never falls. And they cry over things they will never lose. We exaggerate difficulties. We may even blame and accuse God, and we forget his promises and his faithfulness. This is spiritual instability. In the book of James, in the New Testament, he talks about this in form of just simply asking God for wisdom. He says, when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Fear, and for that matter, really, all of the emotions that God has given to us, fear makes a very good servant. It's important to know what to fear and when to fear and to act accordingly. Fear can be our friend. It is a very good servant, along with all of our other emotions. But it is a terrible master. And when it masters us, we are allowing our feelings to play an outsized role in our spiritual life. And the instability that causes is that we are strong in the Lord as long as we're not afraid, as long as we're not challenged, as long as circumstances are going according to plan. I wonder if you, if I, have a habit of walking up to the edge of God's will and his promises, but then backing away because of fear and faithful, faithlessness. Of course, to act on God's promises and to trust him, we must know what he has said in his word, but we also must marry to that knowledge courage. Courage. Godly Courage. It's not the absence of fear, courage isn't, but it is the triumph over fear. So, one form of spiritual instability is that which is produced by fear. Fear and other emotions that eclipse our faith in the goodness and power of God. Second, form of instability, really comes from the following passage there in Deuteronomy. I'm going to pick up reading again, 
shorter passage from verse 40. This is Moses, again, speaking to the people, but he's quoting now, he begins quoting the Lord himself. He says, But as for you, turn around and set out towards the desert along the route to the Red Sea. Then you, Israelites, replied, We have sinned against the Lord. We will go up and fight as the Lord our God has commanded us. So every one of you put on his weapons, thinking it easy to go up into the hill country. But the Lord said to me, Tell them, do not go up and fight, because I will not be with you. You will be defeated by your enemies. So I told you, but you would not listen. You rebelled against the Lord's command, and in your arrogance you marched up onto the hill country. The Amorites who lived in those hills came out against you. They chased you like a swarm of bees and beat you down from Seir all the way to Hormah. So, as you might recall, the Israelites, having been told that because of their lack of faith, they would not have the privilege, that generation, of entering into the promised land, they said, oh, okay, we changed our minds, we'll go anyway. And the Lord said, no, not, it's too late. But they go in spite of it. And Moses, in his recounting of that, says, I told you, but you would not listen. This is the instability in our spiritual lives that comes from arrogance. I know better. I know better. I don't need to pray and listen to God. I don't need to consult His Word. I don't need wise and godly counsel from others. I know better myself. This is the instability that comes from an unteachable spirit. Rick Warren is quoted as saying, it is wise to learn from experience. It is wiser to learn from the experience of others. And when we do not want to learn, either from our own experience or from that of others, but willfully determine that we will rely on ourselves, regardless of God's word to us, we find ourselves distanced from God and without His blessing. So what is the need here? We said for the instability of fear, we must match it with godly courage. For the instability of this kind of self-willed arrogance, we need the discipline of humility. Godly humility. Humility that will doubt, not the Lord, but our own first impulses. That will seek out guidance from the Lord through His Word, by His Spirit, and in the counsel of other people. Of course, humility is a virtue we hear about throughout Scripture, including in Proverbs 18, before a downfall the heart is haughty, but humility comes before honor. Humility, the capacity to stop and reflect on our own decisions, choices, thoughts. Is this just me deciding to do something, plunge ahead without consulting the Lord? It takes a clear and open-eyed sense of ourselves. Humility is not humiliation, although I will tell you that the unwillingness to humble ourselves can often lead to humiliation. But humility is not humiliation. It's just an open-eyed, clear-headed sense of who we really are, including our weaknesses and even our own sinfulness. So, number two, has self-will or arrogance caused you, caused me, to go up and down in my walk with the Lord, taken from me a stable consistent walk with Jesus. Finally, number three. 
This is referenced by Paul in a very kind of uh, short allusion, but it's back in chapter 4. And he recalls one more instance of instability of the Israelites leading up to the moment that they are now faced with. And this is actually an instance that had happened not that long prior. In other words, this current generation had been involved. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, I want to read just two verses, 3 and 4. This is where Moses says to them, You saw with your own eyes, they had seen it, what the Lord did at Baal Peor. They all Peor. The Lord your God destroyed from among you everyone who followed the Baal, the Baal of Peor. And all of you who held fast to the Lord your God are still alive today. So what is he talking about here? Well, this is a incident that had happened. It's recorded back in Numbers 25 in more detail, but the short version is this, that in spite of their calling to be a distinct, holy, meaning set-apart people, many of the Israelites indulged in sexual immorality with the Moabite women, the, the surrounding culture. And in addition to the sexual immorality with the Moabite women, they also, the Israelites, did sacrifice to the Moabite gods. It said that the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with the Moabite women who invited them to the sacrifices to their gods. The instability that comes from the sheer pursuit of pleasure. Abandoning the true and holy God for the siren call of sinful desires. This isn't about enjoying the good gifts from God. This is about pursuing the forbidden fruits. This is the I want. I want. I want. I want. This is the, and who will ever know? Satisfying our desires as our master. Well, the discipline needed here, of course, is a kind of godly self-denial. It says in Scripture that all the promises of God are yes in Christ Jesus. But you know it also says in Scripture that we are to learn how to say no. Let's practice that. This is not an easy word to utter sometimes. Let's just practice it. No. One more time. No. What am I getting at here? In Titus chapter 2, Paul says that the grace of God that has appeared, that offers salvation to all people, teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Learning to say no to ourselves. So, spiritual instability as modeled for us by the Israelites. The instability in their walk with the Lord because of fear. The instability in their walk with the Lord because of arrogance. And the instability in their walk with the Lord because they pursued pleasure. When our feelings, our self-centered willfulness, or our pursuit of pleasure rule over us, we cannot hope to walk consistently with the Lord. And church, these impulses, which, let's face it, are true for each of us, are also in the world around us. In fact, and this is just by way of preparation for us, they're celebrated in our culture today. I am how I feel. That's the true me. I will do what I want. And I will satisfy my every desire. These are not only present all around us, they are celebrated. 
And as God's people, as a people living with a calling on this earth, we too must enter into a future in which these things cannot be known among us. We heard read for us from Deuteronomy chapter 4 by, by Pastor Mark, a passage there from Deuteronomy and Moses' um, words to the people. And I want to read it one more time because while, as it says in the New Testament, these experiences of the Israelites of the Old Testament have been given to us as examples and to warn us, they don't necessarily change us. Here's what I mean. Let me read again a portion of what we heard read earlier. This is Moses speaking to the people. He says, looking back to another generation, the day that they were at Mount, the time that they were at Mount Sinai, he said, Remember the day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, when he said to me, Assemble the people before me to hear my word, so that they may learn to revere me as long as they live in the land and may teach them to their children. You came near and stood at the foot of the mountain while it blazed with fire to the very heavens with black clouds and deep darkness. Then the Lord spoke to you out of the fire. You heard the sound of words but saw no form. There was only a voice. He declared to you his covenant, the Ten Commandments, which he commanded you to follow and then wrote them on two stone tablets. And the Lord directed me, that's Moses, at that time to teach you the decrees and laws you are to follow in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. This was how Moses was preparing the people for their future. For us, it's a new day, it's a new week, it's even a new month. And maybe even we would call it a new season. To be ready for what God will do in and through us in the future. And like those Israelites, we cannot be unstable in this chaotic world and fulfill the calling that we have upon ourselves to, in the name of Jesus, bring his blessing. But we also can't just resolve to do better. The Israelites did that. They had said there at Horeb after they heard God speak in this very intense and dramatic and indeed fearful way, everything the Lord has said we will do. And we See how that went. No, we need a better way. And there is a better way that God has provided. The Old Testament is given to warn us. The gospel is given to save us. And in words that echo back to that instance there at Mount Sinai, the writer to the Hebrews says, you have not come, Christians, to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. No, church, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. You and I, we must commit ourselves to a kind of spiritual stability in order to be fulfilling the purposes that God has for us. But this will not happen by our mere resolve. Yes, we need godly courage, humility, and self-control. But to do any of that, you need Jesus. You need, we need a new covenant. We need the Holy Spirit. We need to be changed from the deepest places within and find a power and a stability that is really not inherent in our natural selves, that we can live in an unstable world with a divine stability.